Hey, what's up, guys? It's Michael from The Honest Youth Pastor back again with another sermon review. Today, we are going to be looking at a sermon from someone by the name of John Pavlovich. John was suggested by one of you via the comment section of either Instagram or uh, YouTube or maybe even the DMs. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at one of his sermons. It was preached. The most recent one I could find was December 12th of this last year, 2021, and it was entitled Happy Holidays and a Blue Christmas. Uh, I don't know. I know nothing <laughs> about John. Uh, this is the first sermon I've seen of him. His face from the thumbnail of this video does look familiar, so I'm sure I've seen his face maybe on like uh, Twitter or on a picture or something, but I don't. I've never listened to him before. So today we are going to be probably, this is one of the few sermon reviews where we might get through the whole sermon. Shocker. The sermon itself apparently is only 16 minutes and 45 minutes seconds long so uh, we have a pretty good chance so we're going to actually be able to see in entirety uh what john has to say here because this is a pretty short sermon um at uh what church is it uu peace fellowship i that's probably universal unitarianism and if it is boy are we in for a treat so let's go ahead and get started and find out um kind of what's going on. Um, one of the things I want to uh, kind of really point you to before we get into the sermon are, are two things. One, especially with this sermon review, uh, this sermon at the time that I'm watching it has 32 views on YouTube. So I, I, I wouldn't normally say this because it isn't like a huge deal because most of the time when we do sermon reviews, the videos have like thousands and thousands of views on them. Um, but don't go to this video and be a troll and comment and dislike just to do that. Don't, don't be, don't be a turd. Um, what I do want to do is provide the link for this video in the description below. So as if you want to watch through this sermon without my commentary, you can do that. Now, as we watch through this sermon, in case you're new to the sermon reviews, there are a few things we're looking for. Uh, first, we want to know if he reads scripture. Secondly, we want to see if uh, when he reads scripture, if he uses it correctly. And thirdly, we want to see if he mentions uh, Jesus within the sermon. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm pretty excited about actually being able to get through a whole sermon, possibly. Um, so let's see what he has to say. Good morning again. It's so good to see you. This will be my last time with you, I think, this year. And um, I'd like to thank this community for just um, being such a source of kindness and light in my life. So I appreciate all of you. Thank you. And thanks to everybody at home. Uh, I love that uh, that Ken, I think Ken chose, or, or Cindy chose the song that we sang a few minutes ago, um, Deck the Halls with boughs of holly. Tis the season to be jolly. Tis the season to be jolly. I'm sorry, but that's too much pressure for me. Okay, uh, maybe it is for you too. The declaration that this is now the season to be jolly is something that I'm not necessarily comfortable with all the time. And being jolly would be a challenge for many of us, right? Even without being in the second year of a pandemic that seems like it will never end, without being in the year of the first non-peaceful transfer of power in our nation's history and all that's happened because of that, even without having to argue with our friends and families and neighbors about the merits of wearing masks and getting vaccinated. Okay, so we'll stop real quick, because normally within the first kind of introduction here, um, we would have scripture or a story, which I guess he's kind of telling the story here in regards to kind of, I'm interested to see where he takes this, but I do want to note one thing. Um, there have been in the past, not, I think maybe two, not more, probably more than that sermons that we've looked at that are from like a lot, like from what would be considered probably conservative churches in regards to the fact that like one of them had president Trump, uh, former president Trump at the actual service. So that, you know, I mean, you kind of know they're leaning <laughs> right away when that happens. Um, but in those regards, I think a lot of those churches and part of my critique in that sermon review, the previous sermon review was that like, you're kind of, you're, you're taking the the message off of what you should be doing as you fellowship together and you're putting it on something else. 
And that seems to be what John's doing here. Like we automatically within the first minute and a half, um, kind of know the leanings of the church. And that's, that's, in my opinion, that is bad, whether it be uh, what would you can consider a, a right-leaning church or a left-leaning church. Because at that point, the church is supposed to be united in Jesus, right? So we have secondary issues or um, kind of things that each individual is working through via our sanctification as we are with other believers. What's happened, and this is just one little evidence of it, I guess, that we can speak on for a second, is that the church is kind of split into groups, right? So you have this group over here that's more left-leaning. You have this group over here that's more right-leaning. And we're not united over the gospel anymore. We're united over secondary peripheral issues that are important and should be discussed, but they're becoming primary to the mission of whatever this church over here is or whatever this church over here is. And it's problematic to say the least. We're not going to spend this sermon review talking about it, but I do want to note that like in his intro, like if you're sitting there, you kind of know if you're in the club or out of the club, depending on what side you sit on, just as if you were going to one of those conservative churches. You kind of know if you're in the club or out of the club, depending on what they say at the beginning and what they're clapping about, what they're cheering about. Um, so this is an interesting way to start a sermon. Let's see kind of, hopefully he takes this and sort of works it into scripture somehow, and we'll see kind of where that goes. Even without having to learn what words like Omicron mean, without all of this, the normal wear and tear of life, the normal collateral damage of being human would be enough to threaten all of our holidays and keep them from being merry and bright. We have in this room health issues, watching along. We have financial worries. We have relational tensions. We have family squabbles. We have random emergencies that just rise up out of nowhere that will even arise today. And we're dealing all of this. We're dealing with all of it while being immersed in calendar specific expectations of good cheer. It's the most frustrating time of the year. Okay, so time out real quick. So I, I want to say this before he kind of moves into scripture, which I assume he's going to do soon. But I want to say this from a from a pastoral standpoint in which like I'm kind of planning out a sermon, right? The idea is what he's doing, though it does have a leaning of sorts, isn't necessarily bad because he's bringing to the forefront of kind of the frustrations that any congregant would feel in regards to everything kind of going on in their life. And you can use that, bringing it to the forefront in order to then say, uh, yet scripture says this, right? So script, there's a ton of scripture that talks about the believer being able to have joy in the time of sorrow, right? There's a lot of scripture talking about how we should, um, like Psalm 121 is this scripture about like, where does my help come from? Like no matter what's going on, my help comes from the Lord. Like this real hope in the sustainer uh, of life, that being the creator God. Um, and then we see within the New Testament, like just this continual hope from, from Paul and Peter writing to churches about, yeah, things are happening, but you have Christ. You can persevere through them. And actually through this perseverance, you, you're you able to, to grow in your sanctification. You're able to witness about the hope you have in Christ. So like there are these scriptures that speak to this. So so this intro isn't necessarily too bad because what you have is this real bringing to the surface, maybe the frustrations that are in this congregation. Now, the reason I bring that up now, because I am interested to see where he kind of takes this from here uh, to see what he does with that, right? So if you're going to bring up everything, where kind of are we going with it? You and me, we're under a constant pressure, but specifically right now, we are under two distinct pressures. The first is that we are expected to be perpetually joyful right now. The obligation to be happy, it's there every day, right? But it's particularly powerful this time of year. And for those of us here and watching online who battle with depression or contend with grief or struggle with self-doubt, 
ordinary times can be challenging, but life is never more exhausting than in a season when everyone else seems to be singing. Two years ago, I had a serious mental health crash a few days after Christmas when I was at the lowest, most hopeless point that I'd ever been in the 51 years of my life. And I realized that part of it was I was feeling the pressure to be part of some perfect holiday that could not exist with me in the condition I was. I felt like I had to get better because of the calendar. And today I want to remind you that your sadness does not take a holiday that your grief does not honor the fact that you want to do other things right now. More than any other time of the year, you might feel a pressure to be well, to pull it all together, to deck the halls and don your gay apparel and let your heart be light and be appropriately jolly. And I want to release you from that today. Because what the holidays can do is they can actually magnify loss for us. They can amplify sadness. We gather together with people we love at this time of year, and yet we're always mindful of the empty chairs. All right. So again, I don't want to keep breaking in too much, but I do want to press on this thing that, that kind of where he's going. So it'll be interesting to see. I'm interested to see if he connects it with scripture, because right now we're about five minutes in into a 16 minute sermon. So we're one fourth through the way through. So where are we going to connect this to scripture? Now, what he's doing here, and I do, I do want to kind of give him credit where credit's due. He is bringing forth the reality that lots of people uh, feel during the holidays. Like if you, if you've pastored ever, you, you know that um, there are, I mean, people all the time. Are having are, are having kind of monumental moments that are so close to holidays, especially when they lose loved ones. There are a a handful of people at my church that have lost loved ones either close to Easter or back close to Christmas or right before Thanksgiving, and now in their heads, like those those events, those holidays are now forever connected to that person's passing. Somebody that's uh, pretty high up within our denomination, the denomination I'm a part of, just passed away, and Easter uh, is you know just just a couple months away or a month and a half or so, and like they're going to connect, like their their wife is now going to probably connect with Easter to like this leading up to Easter because of their husband's death, and that's just a reality. So. With that being a reality, like it is good what he's doing in regards to saying, hey, sometimes holidays amplify this. So I think what what we're listening for, especially as pastors, <clears throat> is we need to recognize that, yeah, this is a reality. So with that being true, what can we say in regards to the hope of the gospel? Not not because what he's talking about is is true in regards to sometimes people try to be happy like force happiness whenever there are sad moments but what we can see in the gospel uh what we can see in, in the life of a believer is that even in those sad moments there's a joy that is connected to christ not a happiness not like some fleeting thing where i'm going to hop around the house and just be happy all the time but there is this hope that we have in christ despite the terribleness so Let's kind of see where he goes with this, because what he's doing, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily bad, because he is kind of bringing up the truth of life. The question is, where are we going to connect this to Scripture? Because if we do that well, it could have a pretty powerful impact on, on a, a believer's life. We make note of who is not there due to death or disagreement. As we repeat, beloved traditions, we realize the ones that have been interrupted by time and by distance and by circumstance. We have nostalgia this time of year that comes through songs and movies and activities, and yet those can be decidedly bittersweet when they arrive because they might remind us about when we thought days were better than they are now, when we felt more joy than we feel now. They might remind us of a day when we were surrounded by more people than we are now. In general, we don't do sad very well, do we? 
Just ask someone how they are. You know how they are? They're good. How are you? I'm good. Everyone seems to be good, and yet we're not good. Most of us, if we're honest, I, I was a pastor for a long time, and I would see people in the hallways, and I would say that, hi, how are you? And you know what I would do? I'd pray they didn't answer me honestly. One time I said to a woman, how are you? And she said, can I tell you? And I said, oh, please don't. <laughs> but the truth was, I didn't want to be inconvenienced by unpleasant news from her. And we all do that. We all on the surface want to make people think that we're better than we are, rather than admitting, I'm kind of a mess. I'm grieving a lot right now. I feel really insecure. My marriage is shaky. Our finances are horrible. So I think this touches on, I mean, <laughs> cards on the table. I don't think he's going to get to scripture. I just, I think if you were going to have gotten to scripture, you would have already gotten there. I could be wrong. If we do, that's great. I just, I don't think we're going to get there. Um, but that being said, what he's kind of, the string he's pulling at here, I think we can learn from as believers, as well as, as pastors, is that there is a lack, a real lack of Christian community and Christian fellowship in regards to pain and suffering and death. The best way I think I've seen this modeled is when the church is actually a family together, right? Because in a healthy family, whenever someone passes, the, the rest of the family comes alongside of them, grieves with them, sits with them, helps them. Like that's just, that's just what a family does uh, when, it, when it's operating well, when it loves each other well. And I've seen that happen in a church as well, like where, the, where everybody knows, hey, this is what I'm going through. This is what's going on. Maybe not everybody in the church knows that person's situation, but there are people within that church that are connected to this person that know what's happening to them, that can offer up prayers for them, that can tell others to pray for them and intercede for them. And that's a healthy body of believers to where when you ask, for example, hey, how are you doing? You genuinely want to know. Like, hey, how was your week? Oh, it was really rough. Well, what was rough about it? And just like, just being someone's friend, right? The reason I think there's this, what what he's saying is connecting with people within his this audience here. It's because it's, it's true. There's lots of times where we just don't like, <laughs> you, you, you either don't ask the question or you don't know the person well enough to actually um, engage at that level of intimate conversation. But here's the thing, as believers, and let me tell you, I, I'll just tell you a personal story during this, inter, during this uh, sermon review. Whenever you purposefully engage in that conversation of asking, how are you? And, and being okay with if the answer comes back and you have to kind of go deeper really quick with someone. I built that in early on in my ministry of asking people, how are they? Not even my ministry, just my life of asking people, how are you? And the other day at my job, uh, again, I work a job outside of ministry. And at my job, part of uh, one of the, the places I was at selling product, uh, I asked them how they were. Now, I interact with this person probably twice, three times a week, each week. And I asked them how they were as I had asked them before. And they came back and they said, it's been a really bad week. And I said, what did you mean? And they went on to tell me about a, about their, their niece and how their niece had just found out they probably had bone cancer and all of the things they were having to go for. And you could tell she was emotionally very, very vulnerable at that moment. So I gave her a minute. She went out. She actually went back uh, to the to the back of the store we were at. She, you know, had to go get a tissue. She cried a little bit. And I did what I needed to do. And then before I left, I said, hey, can I, do you care if we pray for your niece right now? Because I would like to, I don't know about you, but I'm a Christian. I believe in that Jesus has the power to, to heal. I believe that he, 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 he died and he rose again. And I, I believe that, you know, he's God. And if you don't mind, I would, I would like to either pray with you or have permission from you for my, for my church to pray for your niece. And then she said, yeah, I, I'm totally okay with us praying together about that. Now we were able to do that. And that's not to say, oh, look what I did. That's just to say like, when you enter into, when you have the mentality to enter into this conversation of how are you in a genuine way, then you're going to have these opportunities to, to, 
to turn the perception around of what John here is talking about. There's this perception that like we don't really care about what other people say. So people's default reaction is to say I'm fine because they've been asked that before. And when they do try to get vulnerable, people do shut down. So as believers, we should be able to enter into things where we kind of flop that perception. Like <clears throat> we turn that perception on its head and be like, no, I really want to know. I'm, I'm genuinely interested in your life. So I think Christians have this opportunity to really to, to fight back against this perception that people, you know, I don't really want to know your answer, right? When he was a pastor, he said, I mean, again, not to, not to put shame on him, but, you know, as a pastor, that is part of your job is to shepherd your flock. So to pray that they're not going to answer you honestly is a bit odd, um, but everybody has their day, right? But anyway, that being said, let's, let's keep going. I just wanted to kind of interject that <clears throat> because I think as believers, we have this opportunity to really kind of turn that idea on its head and that gives us opportunity to share the gospel in doing so but yet that's what is real that's who we are right now most of the time we feel guilty in our grief and our sadness because we feel like it makes other people uncomfortable and maybe it does but many people who deal with depression or grief describe to me running into people who have reached their compassion threshold. They realize that the people around them have just saturated all that they can take. And they're expected to have gotten over whatever it is they've been going through. As if the grief and the sadness is an isolated event that we're going to pass through and not a continuing wound. And when late November rolls around, we have a special pressure to joy up. We just did a ritual here, a sharing of joys and concerns. Or in my church where we grew up, it was joys and sorrows. Can you imagine if we said, let's share our joys, keep your sorrows for another place. <laughs> Please share only your joys, your concerns are of no matter to us. No, we come here and we embrace the fullness of what it means to be human. We don't shy away from either because that there's beauty in the joy and in the sorrow. And I think what we can do this holiday is we can make space for the unpleasant and the uncomfortable and the annoying. We can invite the sadness into our gatherings. So you're under a pressure to be happy, but you're under another pressure too. You also face the pressure to be perfect. This time of year, the lights on the house or the Okay, so his first point was you feel the pressure to be joyful and this offer no scripture at all in this whatsoever. And the second one is now going to be the prefer the pressure to be perfect. Now, this would be the an ample opportunity to go into scripture talking about how it's not our righteousness that saves us, but it's Christ's righteousness in us, right? So Christ uh, transfers his righteousness to us. And though we're not righteous, right? We're seen as righteous because of his life, death, resurrection uh, on the cross. Um, so this would be a, a perfect place. I and mean, we could have talked about that as far as the joyfulness, right? So we have lots of, um, lots of scripture talking about how um, you can be joyful. You can have hope when there doesn't seem to be hope, right? So let, here, let's do that real quick because we got, we got a little bit of time. This, this sermon, uh, the shortness of it actually gives us an opportunity to, to delve in a little bit to scripture. So uh, I preached a sermon uh, using this passage this last week. I'll upload that here sometime soon uh, if you're interested in hearing that. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, he's talking about... Um, the fact that they've been dispersed and that even though they're following Jesus' teachings, some of them are being persecuted for that. Some of them are suffering for that. So in verse 13 of chapter 3, that's where we'll start. It says, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, it, you will be blessed. Uh, have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ as Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for your hope, for the hope that is within you, yet do it with gentleness and respect and having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. The whole idea is that Peter is talking to these people that are dispersed and says, yeah, 
You're living lives that are following Christ. And logically, you think, why am I being persecuted for that? Why is there anyone that can bring any account against me? And he says, it's going to happen. And if it does happen, if you do suffer for righteousness sake, right? If there's something you're going through uh, because of your following Christ, the question that will come up then is, well, where's your hope? Because you shouldn't have, logically, the world says you shouldn't have hope because you're, 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 you're suffering and you're say you're suffering for no apparent reason. And if that's the case, where's your hope? And he says, be prepared to give that a reason for the hope within you, that reason being Jesus, that you can say, I, I can be hopeful in situations that don't seem hopeful. Um, that would have been, a, 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 you, I guess you could have used that for his first point. It's not directly connected because the, 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 the situations he's talking about aren't necessarily persecution or suffering for Christ's righteousness sake sort of situations. But the same holds true that a Christian in situations of suffering, of, of circumstances that aren't perfect, can still look to Christ for their joy because that is our hope. He is our joy. Um, now we're going to move into the second section here on apparently you're expected to be perfect. Um, again, I cards on the table. I don't think he's going to use any scripture. So all three of the things that we look for, does he read the scripture? Does he use it correctly? Does he mention Jesus? I don't think we're going to hit any three of those. Um, but we might still, I think we actually have an opportunity to get all the way through this. So that being said, let's see what he says about the, the, the idea that you have to be perfect during the season, Christmas specifically. Shape of your Christmas tree or your Christmas card photos or the gifts that you give or the cookies you make or your appearance at parties can all exacerbate the comparison sickness that we are afflicted with almost every day of the year. We look at Hollywood holiday movies and we want to be like the Baileys from It's a Wonderful Life, but we feel more like the Griswolds in Christmas Vacation, right? What we find ourselves often doing is looking at other people's lives from afar and using them to measure our lives up close. Whether the lights on our houses or the trees in our living rooms or our bank accounts or our marriages or our bodies or our careers or our families, we view others in the soft, flattering glow that distance provides. While seeing ourselves and our families in the raking light of close proximity, that means we're always coming up short from how we feel everyone else is doing. We usually feel lack and less than. I saw a video from a UPS driver this week. He went to a house with one of the ring doorbells. And on the video, you see the UPS driver go, hey, Dan, how you doing? Just wanted to deliver this to you. And he said, I noticed there's a lot better lights on most of the houses around here. He said, so string a few more up. He said, do better, Dan. And he left. Now he was being funny, but that's what we do. We all do it to Dan. We do it to our spouses and our partners and our friends and our families and our children. Do better. Because there is such a pressure to be, someone called it the stock family. You know the family that's in the photo that you get with the frame? They're the stock family. You'll never be as happy as the stock family. Your children's teeth will never be as straight without spending a lot of money. So you're under pressure and I wonder what if this season you decided to welcome the what is of your life, not the what was, not the what could have been or what should be. I just want to note real quick like this. So we have six minutes left roughly in this sermon, which we'll, I will easily be able to get to. And this was given at, I mean, it's, they call it a fellowship. It's U, U U Peace Fellowship. So I don't, I mean, I'm sure they would consider itself a gathering or a fellowship and not a church. But this is essentially what it is. It's a church. It's a group of people coming together uh, to meet. Um, and at some point, maybe this fellowship even believed in Jesus as the Son of God. I would, maybe they still do. I, I doubt it. Um, I... <sighs> You can't have a church that doesn't open scripture and expect them to actually believe in Christ. Uh, from what we can tell from the beginning of the sermon, apparently the song they sang was a very generic Christmas song. It wasn't even a Christ-centric Christmas song. Um, as we've went through this entire sermon, John has mentioned um, the 
no hope in Christ, hasn't mentioned anything, even re, even close to spiritual. Um, it, even, even the most um, gray terms. I mean, this could literally be a, uh, like a, a country club meeting, um, just some sort of group of people that get together because you want some sort of social interaction. Um, this, this is what that is. This isn't a church. Um, we've, we've heard no scripture. We've heard um, not even, I wouldn't even classify this as a TED talk because it's not, I mean, a TED talk for depression, I suppose, if that's what we're going to go through right now. This really just acceptance of the fact that you're sad, which I mean, look, there's a reality that sometimes what he's saying is true for the non-believer. For the non-believer, there's some points where you really have to just be like, oh, this is how it is. I'm going to be sad forever and I just need therapy. And for the non-believer, that's probably some of the best advice you're going to get because you have to find a way to cope somehow. Um, so, you know, through the terribleness of what life has maybe brought along somebody's life that he's talking to, um, that's, that's your best option is to figure out how to deal with it, um, how to live with it. And um, there's no hope of Christ here. It's totally devoid of that. There's no um, hope of the gospel. There's no uh, perseverance through Christ. There's, there's nothing. This is so far been a waste of 10 minutes for people that are sitting there. I mean, what, I mean, minus the fellowship and the, the friendship time that you may have while you're here, this is just emptiness. Let's keep going. I mean, let's see if it improves in six minutes. But what is, and find the good in the what is of this moment, this holiday. Because we feel the pressure to be happy and perfect. And the holidays are a uniquely challenging season, one where we can have trouble being the most important thing we have to be, which is real. Our family grew up, I grew up Christian, so we always celebrated Christmas. We've always had a Christmas tree, and my wife and I, when we got married, we got an artificial tree, a gift from our parents, and we had it for years, and it was a really nice artificial tree, and it was great in the ways that artificial trees are. It always stayed green. It never needed watering. It always fit that space perfectly. It was always perfectly symmetrical, but then it stopped, the light stopped working and we had to decide what to do. And we got a real tree and we realized that the artificial tree had some great things, but it didn't have what real trees have. It didn't fill the house with that unmistakable aroma. It didn't feel the same in your hands, even with the sap that gets on your fingers that smells that way. We didn't have the joyful experience of heading out and going to get that tree and bringing it home. We just walked unceremoniously into the attic, right? Last year, we got a late start on our Christmas tree hunting. And we drove to the Christmas tree lot, and it was no longer there. That's how late we were. So we drove to where we thought the next one was, and there were no trees there. And the third place went, and the fourth, and guess what started to happen? I started to panic. We are going to lose Christmas. And we finally went, we found a place with trees, but you know what kind of trees they were at that point? They were barely Charlie Brown trees. Charlie Brown would have said pass. And so we got this tree home, and we realized it was horribly crooked. And there was a giant bare spot on one side, so we had to finagle it and turn it and get it to the right spot, and we overcompensated with lights and ornaments. But you know what? It was, it was a great tree. Christmas was beautiful, and it was wonderful. The imperfections are beautiful. The imperfections of your marriage are beautiful. The imperfections of your children, they're beautiful. The imperfections of you. They're beautiful. And that's the kind of holiday I want for you. And for So I, man, I don't even, we're, we're close enough to finish this sermon. So we're going to, but I, I'm, I almost need to apologize of how terrible, I mean, this isn't a sermon, right? <laughs> this is, this is, this is me reviewing a, um, a Christmas talk about um, accepting life. That's sort of what's going on. Like, 
that's that's um, that's what's happening. So welcome to your review, <laughs> your your random Sunday morning talk from John review. That's what this is. Uh, my apologies. Uh, here's the thing, and I guess this is a good example for like why true gospel preaching is actually transformative because if it's not filled with preaching of who Jesus is, what he's done, the transformative power that he has in, in one's life, um, the fact that he, he sends the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit trans, just completely transforms us uh, into a new creation. I mean, the old man is dead, the new has come, right? I mean, there's this distinctive difference because if you, if you lack that, if you don't speak of that, this is what you get. Like, this is like just a, a terrible, not even a pep talk, just a, hey, life's going to be terrible. And sometimes you need to, ex you know, accept the terribleness of it and find joy in the little imperfections, basically. And the, the distinctive different with the Christian life is kind of what Peter said in the verse we read. Like, yeah, things are going to happen that are not great. And it's not that Christians should seek after these, these terrible situations. It's just that when these, when these situations come, when things aren't perfect, when ever, you know, everything's not, you know, unicorns and rainbows and hopping through a field happy, right? Christians still have joy and hope in the person and work of who Jesus is. I mean, there are countless stories of believers that have been uh, in terrible situations. They've been uh, held prisoner. They've been tortured. They've been put on, you know, they've been burned at the stake. They've been, everything's been taken away from them. And in those stories, they still have hope in Christ. I mean, I told a story uh, or directed you toward an Instagram page a few sermon reviews ago of a girl named Brooke or Brooklyn, I think is her name. Uh, but the idea was that, I mean, she she was suffering through a disease that was just completely shutting down her entire body. And post after post after post from her was even in this moment of, of absolute, I mean, unimaginable pain that we can't, if you've not gone through it, I, I can't even imagine it. Um, and even through suffering and just knowing this imminent, this imminentness of death in front of you. Um Post after post after post she had pointed back to the reality and the truth of a hope in Christ. And if you were to hear John's talk here, because it's clearly not even a sermon, if you were to hear his talk here at this fellowship, um, there's nothing there. It's just, well, just accept it. It's going to be what it is. It's okay. Just be super sad all the time. And to be truthful, you... you in those situations, it's not that the sadness goes away. It's not that the reality of death disappears. It's not that um, you just get incredibly happy. It's just that you have an underlying understanding as a believer that despite what's happening, there is a hope I have in a risen Savior and that is the distinctive difference between believers and unbelievers. It's not when everything's going great that believers really shine. Because when everything's going wonderfully, right? And there's there's joy all the time and you know everything's going perfect and you can appear perfect. Like that's every like you can't tell believers from unbelievers in those moments. But in the times of real like suffering and sorrow and joylessness or happily, you know, when happy doesn't come easy, or even in the second point where John here's talking about trying to be perfect, right? Even in those moments, like you're going to be able to tell who's a believer and who's not by the default reaction. It's not that believers are are fake happy or just can plow through the situation. It's that like, regardless of what comes at you, there's this hope in Christ. And I cannot, I've seen that time and time and time again from believers. That, and it, it amazes me every single time, the power of Christ in a person's life. In the face of death and in face of poverty, in the face of job loss, in the, fa in the face of like circumstances that don't make sense, they have hope. And Christian, we have hope in a risen Savior despite the circumstances that come because the gospel of whatever he's preaching here is nonsensical. 
Anyway, let's keep going. We got four minutes left to see what we get. For me, beautifully imperfect with all the mess and all the flaws and all the less than pretty things. I want to let go of the pressure to be more or better or different. I just want to be present. As a Christian, that means I don't need a happy Christmas and I'm not resigned to a blue Christmas. I'm just going to enjoy a real Christmas. I'm going to celebrate when I'm able. I'm going to cry when the tears come. I'm going to sing the songs and I'm going to be in crowds when I can. I'm going to pull away for a few moments to grieve in silence. And I'm going to be okay with all of it. And I want you to be okay with all of it right now. What does this mean for you? This means that you're going to make out some holiday invitations, that you're going to plan a holiday party right now. I hope you'll invite gratitude. I hope that you will see what is if nothing else changes and find something good in that. I want you to invite laughter. I want you to seek out the things that make you light and give you joy. I want you to experience humor because that is such an integral part of being human. I want you to invite generosity over. I want you to give. Find some abundance that you have so that someone else who's living in lack can have more. I want you to invite joy. I want you to cultivate an optimism that is greater than your circumstances. I want you to be relentless about seeking that lightness. And I want you to invite peace. I want you to invite a rest that says, despite everything and because of everything, I am going to exhale into this moment. So yes, invite gratitude, invite laughter, invite generosity, invite joy, invite peace. But have a bigger guest list. Invite grief. Notice the empty chairs. Feel the loss of people you love. Celebrate the fact that you had someone in your life worth missing. Talk about the. I think at this point, <clears throat> I mean, again, we have a minute, so we'll let him finish. But I want, I just want to break in here to break up this sort of monotony. Um, if you go to a a fellowship or a church or a gathering, whatever you want to call it, like this. And um, there is no Bible reading. There is no working through the word. There is no, um, there's no speaking of Jesus. Um, I mean, one, you can count that as a wasted day <laughs> or a wasted uh, time that you've, you've spent. Um, but it let, let it, at least encourage you that there are churches out there that don't do this. I mean, this is, this is crazy. Um, that you, you can have, I mean, it's, I guess it's no wonder it, it only has 32 views because there's not any hope here. I mean, you can get, there's no substance here. You can get this from anywhere. Literally, you can get this from the dude at work that sits down at lunch and is just kind of gives you a pep talk or something. I mean, I'm not sure. I don't know anything about John. I just don't. I'm not sure why John was recommended, to be frank, other than maybe just to say clearly. I mean, he said he grew up Christian. I I don't know as if he understood like, what church he went to if they explained the gospel to him in a way that was understandable because he clearly is not communicating that here. Um, yeah, it's interesting. And so... It, it just it's a this whole thing is a big red flag okay if you go to a church and they don't read the scriptures they don't talk about jesus they don't sing songs to him there is no worship of of the the god that created all things and is in all things and sustains all things um this is what you get so we're gonna let him finish there is literally just over a minute left uh and then we'll wrap this up those people let the grief sit at the table with you Invite depression. Don't feel pressure to change how you feel. Simply allow yourself to be exactly who you are and exactly how you're wired. Invite your loneliness. 
feel whatever isolation or estrangement that you feel right now and don't judge it. Invite your worry, your fears of the future, your things you can't control, even though you should let them go, invite them in so that you can admit that right now it's hard to be present because of the future. And invite your disappointment, the ways you've fallen short, your failures, because you're in good company with them. I hope that you'll make space and invite all the joys and all the sorrows, that you'll welcome them all when they arrive and that you'll embrace the messy reality of authenticity this season. So have a happy holiday and a blue Christmas and a season where you don't have to choose one or the other. Okay. So um, that was that. Um, so we are, we're going to end there. The interesting thing uh, about this whole deal <laughs> is that oh, we didn't read any scripture at all. None. Um, now I do want to acknowledge where, I guess where good things that came up that maybe we as pastors can maybe embrace a bit. And that was the reality of kind of bringing up the truth that, you know, people suffer. Now, if you're a pastor, you know that you've been in those rooms, you've talked to those people. Um, I think sometimes for other believers, it's good for, for us to hear that. Um, because some people haven't gone through those things and are oblivious to that sort of pain. They haven't got to that place in their life yet where they're suffering through lots of things. And it is good for people to hear about that so as they can, so as, so as they can be prepared for when those times come, right? Um, one of the jobs of a pastor is to, to equip believers with scripture, uh, knowing how to read it, knowing how to work through it, um, pointing them to that, you kind of building up that foundational base in their life so that when various circumstances come, we as believers are prepared to deal with that. We're not blindsided. We're going, oh yeah, this is expected. And this is how as a believer, as a follower of Christ, I should react. Um, so that, that, that comes with anything like loss of life, uh, circumstances change in our life, uh, you know, loss of family members or friendships, um, huge shifts financially, like all of that as pastors, we should be declaring the word of God to our people. Um, so as to prepare them for that. So as to, so when they get there, as Peter says, if they're suffering right for righteousness sake, they can give a hope. Like, where's your hope? Well, this is my hope. My hope is in Christ. I, I do want to leave you with this because I think this is uh, bare minimum what you should hear during a sermon and what was totally, totally left out of what we just watched. And it's from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, or I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians, yeah, chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And it says this, uh, this is Paul writing to the Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with scriptures. Um, at the bare minimum, there should be some sense of that in a sermon, that there's this declaration that we do have hope, that we, we, we can have joy in terrible situations, not a happiness that's fleeting, but a joy that's present in a hope that Jesus, he came, he lived, he died, he rose again. Um, and that is the central difference between a believer and a non-believer is that we follow this Christ. We have this underlying hope in our lives that, that they, they just don't have. Um, and I think that was incredibly present in this particular sermon. It was just devoid of all of it. So anyway, hopefully that was helpful. I, I feel like maybe it wasn't at all. Um, I feel like I sort of wasted your time, to be honest with you. But I guess it's good to notice and to recognize that there are churches that are totally devoid uh, or churches. There are people that gather together and call themselves a fellowship or a church or a gathering um, that are totally devoid of anything of Christ. 
Um, and basically it's a really fancy club that people meet together in and then they give each other money so as to keep this little club building up. It's essentially what it is. So hopefully this was helpful. If you found it helpful, make sure you like, you comment, you subscribe, and you share it with others uh, so you can uh, get these each week uh, on Saturday. So guys, thanks for watching. I'll talk to you later.